you would turn with me to the gospel according to John chapter 20. As we close out our series, A God Who Stoops. John chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. John chapter 20. Beginning at verse 1. It reads, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. Amen. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. You may be seated. This morning, we would like to use for a take-home thought the evidence of the empty tomb. The evidence of the empty tomb. About a little over three years ago, I lost my father in the middle of COVID. Five months later, I lost my mother. Two hours after losing my mother, my wife got a call saying her uncle had passed away. And so it was a heart moment. But even in hard moments, we find resolve in going to the grave site to visit our loved ones. Because going to the grave site allows you to be able to emote and it allows you to be able to grieve and it allows you to be able to show honor and it shows respect to the person who is now deceased. All of my family members would go and my sister would go and she would take pictures and my siblings would go and they would show me where my father was and show me where my mother was. But it was a hard moment for me to actually go to the grave. And so as we look at this text today, I can only imagine what it must have been like for Mary Magdalene to get up early in the morning before the sun rose to go to the grave of Jesus whom she loved. But this is a story about the resurrection because the empty tomb is the evidence of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pivotal event in human history that serves as the single fundamental theology of Christianity. Think about it. The salvation that we have is based off a tomb that was empty. The faith that you have 
is based off of a grave that didn't have anybody in it. And actually, after assuming human form and enduring a terrible and humiliating public death, the eternal son of God, he was truly raised from the grave in his glorified physical body, free of decay, free of death. His resurrection confirms this. It confirms his identity as God's divine son. It reveals his irreversible victory over death and the grave. And it ensures believers in their current salvation as well as their eventual resurrection. As we take a look at the text today, keep your Bibles open. We're going to walk through this thing today. But as we look at the text, I want you to picture Mary coming to the tomb. Picture Mary walking with her lantern, hopeless and despondent, and her faith dying with Jesus. Mark says that she wasn't alone. Mark says that there were other women with her. Mark says that was the Mary, the mother of James and Salome that were also there with her. And they were on their way to the grave. Can you hear the night sounds starting to fade? As the S-U-N begins to rise. But the S-O-N had already risen. Somebody know where I'm going right now. But Mary is on her way and you can see all of them as they're walking somewhere between the stillness of the night and the emptiness of the air. Tears were flowing. And Mary felt the crushing weight of being alone in a room that's full of people. Anybody ever felt like that before? Well, even though everybody is around you, you still feel alone. Mary was going to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. They were they were going to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. But somewhere along the way, in their grief and in their emoting and in their tears, they forgot one thing. And they started to ask themselves, who who will roll the stone away? Now, I want you to consider this for a moment. You have women that are walking, and this, this is a stone that they said weighed hundreds of pounds. Some say it almost weighed a ton. And now they're asking on the way, who's going to roll the stone away? And so this right here, this would have triggered some of us. Some of us would have got mad right there and said, oh, no, this, I, I came all the way down here and... <laughs> And ain't no way I'm going to be able to move that stone. Some of us would have turned around right there on the spot because you know, ain't no way I'm about to move this stone. But you have to understand what Jesus meant to Mary. Because Jesus meant everything to Mary. And so even though she didn't know how the stone was going to be removed or how the stone would be rolled away, she was still going to go because you got to understand what Mary's been through. Mary didn't have not one demon in her, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven demons on the inside of her having a satanic convention. And now she looked at her life and began to look back and think, there's no way I would be here without Jesus. (laughs) Is that somebody's testimony this morning? That you can look back over your life and understand that there is no way that I could be in the place that I am if it wasn't for Jesus. See, Mary remembered back to where she was. Mary remembered the rooms that she was in. Mary remembered the people that she used to communicate with. Mary remembered the places that she used to go. And so Mary said, it doesn't matter. I still got to get to that tomb. I still got to get to that tomb. But isn't it funny how So many of us do so little for a savior that's done so much. Isn't it amazing how most of us don't want to do anything for a savior that has done everything. 
And it just startles me because maybe, maybe, maybe it will show that maybe there was little sin in a place where there's little effort. Maybe that was the little sin where there now is little effort. But if God has done something. If Jesus has done anything in your life, then you ought to be able to commit and find yourself in a place of devotion to where you ought to want to give him everything. Paul says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all. But there's evidence in the empty tomb. There's evidence in the empty tomb. And I want y'all to walk with me around this text, if you would. Walk with me around. The first piece of evidence that we find is, is evidence in the stone was rolled away. Evidence in the stone that was rolled away. And I need y'all to see this because Mary went to anoint a dead body. (laughs) Y'all missed that. Mary went to anoint a dead body. Mary had spices. Mary had oils and they were going and they were going to the tomb and they were going to anoint a dead body. Because see, anointing a dead body on, on the fourth day would mean it would keep the smells down. It, it would it would make sure that the body wouldn't stink. It would it would make sure that there wouldn't be a, a, a fast uh, decaying and decomposing. And so therefore it would keep the smell from stinking. Y'all remember when they said Lazarus was in the grave and they said he was in the grave for four days and it was already stinking. And so therefore, Jesus don't even go in there. And Jesus said, take me to the place where you laid him. But Mary went to anoint a dead body. It was a sign of love, sign of devotion, a sign of respect. It's like bringing flowers to the grave. But I want you to see this. It says, now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And then she ran. Keep your Bibles open. She ran. She didn't even look in the tomb. She went to anoint first a dead body. And now she gets to the tomb and where she had uh, had purpose out to be. And now she gets there and sees the stone rolled away and she runs. At the sight of the stone being rolled away, she ran. And I'm looking at Mary and I'm looking at us and I'm looking at Mary and I'm looking at us. And for Mary to go and anoint a dead body, it can't help but make me see the church today. That we have religion with no power because that's what it means to go and anoint a dead body because Mary who had followed Jesus still did not believe that this was going to be a resurrection Mary was going to anoint a savior that was dead and so therefore there cannot be any power in a dead savior Acts Confucius (laughs) Ask Muhammad, ask Buddha. There is no power in a dead savior. And so therefore, here we are coming to church every single Sunday. And I can't help but to believe and see that we're coming and we're bringing our flowers. And we're coming and we're showing our respect. And we're coming and we're showing our honor. But we really don't believe that Jesus rose from the grave. We really don't believe that Jesus got up. And so therefore, we come every Sunday and we do our little dance and we do our little shout and we do our little thing on Sunday and we go right back home to the same mess that we left. Because that's what it means to have religion with no power. And there is no power in a dead savior. The only way that there's power if there is a risen savior. And so here it is. She went to a grave. Oh, come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Y'all come to a church every Sunday. Praise God. Give God glory. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my God. He's so good. But you don't think he can fix your problems. 
going to preach to myself today because I, I know I'm on this thing right now. We come to church every Sunday and don't think that God can fix our broken relationship. We come to church every Sunday and don't think that God can fix our broken past. We come to church every Sunday and don't think that God can fix our broken attitude. We come to church every Sunday and don't think that God can fix our broken finances. Why? Because we're serving a dead Savior. Because if you really believe that he got up, if you really believe that he lives, then you will understand that the same power that was in the resurrected Jesus is the same power that's in me. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. See, because if Jesus is not really living, then he's not a living force who can come in and intervene in your life. If Jesus is not really living, then you have a form of religion with no power. If Jesus is not really living, then you've never experienced your own spiritual resurrection. And therefore, you have a form of religion with no power. And it's a shame to see Christians with no power. And so we struggle. And we let the world beat us up and we get enslaved and bondage and we just getting tossed back and forth because we have been coming to church every single Sunday serving a dead savior. But I stopped by to tell y'all this morning that he lives today. My savior lives today. That's why I act so crazy when I get here on Sunday morning. That's why I can't help but smile when I get here on Sunday morning because I know that he lives today and I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives today. He lives. Christ Jesus lives he lives today. Say so he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives salvation to impart. Ask me how. Ask me how I know he lives. Ask me how I know he lives. He lives in my heart. Ah, slow down, y'all taking me too fast. But I need you to see is the evidence is in the stone that was rolled away. Watch this. The stone was not rolled away from the entrance of the tomb so that Jesus could get out. But the stone was rolled away so that they could get in. Oh, y'all missing this thing. Y'all missed this thing. The stone was not rolled. Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away. Jesus had enough power to move the stone all by itself. As a matter of fact, Jesus could have walked right through the stone if he really wanted to. So the stone wasn't rolled away so that he could get out. But the stone was rolled away so that they could get in and they could be able to see the resurrection. So watch this, watch this. The significance of the stone being rolled away is this. This is good. I hope y'all take this home with you. Put this in your back pocket, put it in your back seat. God's ability to remove impossible obstacles in your life. That's why the stone was rolled away because the stone represents the obstacles in your life that seem like they're too hard. The stone represents the things in your life that seem like they're impossible. The stone represents the things in your life that you said, I can't do it by myself. The stone represents the things in your life that when you look at it, just looking at it makes you want to give up. But now just seeing the stone is removed gives me confidence, gives me hope to know that I serve a God, that I don't have to move my own stone. Woo! I don't have to worry about moving it myself because I serve a God that has the ability to move all of the impossible things, all of the things that I thought I couldn't do, all of the things that they said I couldn't do. God has the ability to remove the impossible obstacles. And here's the next thing. Here's the next thing. The stone, 
the significance of the stone being rolled away was to reveal that an empty tomb with nobody, an empty tomb with nobody was evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Watch what she did. She ran and she came to Simon Peter and she came to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I love the way John likes to talk in third person here. John says <laughs> he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now that's, that's something when you call yourself that. He just said that's Peter, but then she also went to the disciple whom Jesus loved. Y'all got to see the comedy in the Bible. Y'all got to read y'all Bible. She said to them, crying in her voice, trembling, you can hear it, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they've laid him. Watch what Mary did. Mary assumed that it was a robbery. Mary assumed it was a robbery and that someone had stolen the body. Can I tell you what she didn't believe? She didn't believe that it was a resurrection. And so she ran back and she cried and she went and told the disciples. She said, y'all got to come on. Somebody has stolen the body and I don't know where they have taken him. But then we get to the second piece of evidence. Come on, we're going to all play in, in specters today. We get to the second piece of evidence and the second piece of evidence is the linen cloths. Let me take you there. Let me take you there. Verse 3 says, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. Watch what John says. John says, so they both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter. John Childish. I just want y'all to know that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that meant. I don't know why he put that in there. But John wanted you to know that I got there first and I beat Peter. To the tomb. Peter was a little bit older. John might have been a little bit younger. Not sure, but but Peter, I mean, John wants you to know I came to the tomb first. Watch what he says. Watch what he said. And he, talking about himself, stooping down, looked in the tomb. <laughs> he was stooping down. Looking in, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. Peter came and followed him and went in the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that was around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded in a place by itself. Now understand this. Peter and John didn't run to the tomb to see if Jesus had been raised. Peter and John ran to the tomb because they were going to investigate a robbery. Oh, I just want to make sure we're there. They went to seek evidence of a stolen body. Peter and John went to investigate a robbery, but instead they experienced a resurrection. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Sometimes y'all come to church for one thing, but what you end up finding is it's a resurrection. And I stopped by to tell y'all that he got up on Sunday morning. See, we don't talk about that enough in the church. We want to tell you how to fix your life. Five ways to make you a better husband. Three ways to make you a better cook. Six ways to make you a better entrepreneur. But we miss out on the most important thing. And the most important thing is that he got up from the grave. Y'all don't want to have church. Y'all don't want to have church. Uh, he got up from the grave. And there's evidence in the linen cloths. But I, I, this, this, I had to investigate this because watch this. This is Peter and John. This is not that is. This is not Nathaniel. This is not Thomas. This is Peter and John who walked closely with Jesus. They were in Jesus' inner circle. They was, they was his boys. Yeah, yeah, this is my running buddy. I don't, I don't even go raise people from the dead without them. They was his boys. But watch this. They didn't even believe what he said. Okay, come on, church folk. 
They've been going to church their whole life. They've been with Jesus their whole time. They've been with Jesus all three years with Jesus, but yet and still they did not believe what he said. They went to Sunday school. They went to BTU. They went to vacation Bible school. They went to teachers meeting. They was at Bible study, but yet and still, they still don't believe what he said. What did he say? Well, what did he say, Pastor? What did he say? John 2 and 18, he says, the Jews then responded to this after Jesus came and knocked over. Maybe he came and knocked over all of the, all the money changers tables. The Jews then responded to him and they said, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, watch this. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recall what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I'm not done. Come here. Matthew 12, 38 says, Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign for you. All y'all who be waiting on signs, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Come here, I'm not done. Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must go to Jerusalem. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, church folk, the hands of the chief, chief priests, church folk, the name of the teachers of the law, church folk, and that he must be killed. But on the third day, be raised to life. And yet it's there all of this teaching that he taught them and they were going to investigate a robbery they were going to investigate a robbery but I need you to see this because Jews Jews buried their dead watch what they did they buried their dead and they had strips of cloth a uh, substance that was made of aloe and spices they said when they would bury the dead it would be almost a hundred pounds of spices that would be laid on them and Joseph of Arimathea who was one of the Sanhedrin uh, leaders he went to Pilate. Joseph appears in all four Gospels in connection with the burial of Jesus. He went to Pilate and he asked Pilate for the body. He asked Pilate for the body because he had his own tomb that he was going to use for Jesus to be buried in. And Nicodemus and, Pilate and, and, and Joseph got together. J Joseph, you got the, the grave. I'll go get the spices. Nicodemus goes and get the spices and when they put the spices and, and they would lay down the linens and they would put the spices all over the linens and they would have the body there and they would prepare the body and they would wrap the body in these linens with all of these spices so every part of the body would be wrapped up and they would almost look like what we see and what we would think would, would, would be like a mummy and so it would all be laying there but I need you to see something the linen was evidence that it wasn't a robbery. The linen was evidence that it wasn't a robbery. Why? Because they, they said when they looked in the tomb, the linens were still intact. It was almost as if this, the, 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 the a tire had went on flat and everything was still in the way that it was. This is so important because you got to understand that here is the linen cloths that are wrapped up, that are still wrapped. None of it's torn up. And so there's no way that this could be a robbery because it would have been a mess. And if they were robbers, they would have took the expensive linens because it was expensive because it came from a rich man. And so they would have took it and stole it. But here it was still laying here. So here is a problem with the text. And we have to investigate that it's laying here. But not only are the linens laying here, but the handkerchief. It's laying over here and it's folded up and I need y'all to see this because this just blew me away when I started to see it is that Jesus got up from the grave and watch this. Jesus wasn't in a hurry. Woo! 
Isn't that just like Jesus? Jesus wasn't in a hurry. Jesus took his time getting up. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God that's all powerful. He didn't have to start ripping stuff off of him. But Jesus just got up and slid right on out of his grave clothes. Set his grave clothes to the side. Took the handkerchief off of his face. Began to fold the handkerchief up and make sure. And then he walked right on out of the tomb. He wasn't in a hurry. He took his time. You know why he took his time? Because he said, no man takes my life. I wish I had a Bible reader. I wish I had a Bible reader. No man takes my life, but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I got the power to pick it back up again. That's the kind of God that we serve. It, it, is there anybody here that understands that you serve a God that takes his time? making sure that he gets up from the grave. Is there anybody in here that serves a God that takes his time to make sure that his grave clothes are folded before he walks out of the tomb? They carry him in. But now he walks out. Ah, Y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't ready. Y'all ain't ready. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is good. This is good. Watch this because I need to I need to teach this. If you look at the text, It says, and he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and Peter just went in the tomb. Y'all missed it. Rewind it. And he, John, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Okay, y'all got it now? Peter walked up there and just said, man, move out the way. Because Peter said, I'm going in. But watch this. The text uses the word saw three different times. But in the Greek, each time that they used the word saw, it was a different meaning. Let me make it plain for you. There are three words. Three separate words that are translated in the same English word, saw. Verse 5 says, and he's stooping down, looking in, he saw the linen cloth. That word saw me, it's a Greek word, is blepo, which means able to see, to notice. I, I can make out what I can see. Everybody walking with me? Then Peter comes in and Peter saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths. That word that Peter saw is the word theoria, which is the Greek word that means to gaze on for the purpose of analyzing and investigating and studying. Oh, y'all gonna get this in a minute. It is the root word of the English word that we call theater. which refers to a place where people go and they concentrate on the meaning of action and they gain an experience. John stood on the outside. He stooped down and looked in and he could recognize that there was a linen cloth. Peter went on the inside and began to study this thing. Peter went on the inside and said, no, 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 something Something ain't adding up. I I, I see the handkerchief over here and I see the linen cloth over here. Something is going on. So Peter began to study it and Peter began to see that this is an experience that has happened. What you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is sometimes, sometimes, sometimes proximity presents a different perspective. Because John was on the outside and Peter was on the inside. And so John's experience wasn't the same as Peter's experience because John was on the outside. What I'm saying to you is that sometimes your experience changes 
when you get in a little bit closer. Your experience changes when you walk in the tomb. Your experience changes when you get closer to the fire. Your experience changes when you start to look at what God has done. Your experience changes when you can be able to recognize that this can't be nobody but God. I didn't do this by myself. There's no way I could have figured this out on my own. This ain't nobody but Jesus. Ah. Hold on, but I'm not done. There's another saw. <laughs> There's another saw. There's another saw. He said, and he stooping down, looking in, John saw the linen. Notice John only saw the linen cloth. Everybody got that? John only saw the linen cloth. Peter came in. He followed and went in the tomb. Peter saw the linen cloth lying there, and Peter saw the handkerchief. He saw the handkerchief and that had been around his head. The handkerchief was around their head to make sure that their mouth would stay closed. Not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Watch this. Then the other disciple, and John still being childish, who came to the tomb first, went in and watch what he said. He saw. This word saw is Edon, which means to see with understanding. Boy, I, I wish I had some church folk to understand. I was outside the tomb and I could only recognize. But now that I'm in the tomb, I can now get an understanding. I was outside of the church and I could just see what was going on. But now that I'm in the church, I can be able to get an understanding of what God. I was outside, but now I'm on the inside. I can be able to understand it better by and by. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. So he began to see it and he began to understand. And so now they're both looking at it and they're looking at it and watch what the text says. And he believed. Woo. Wait a minute. He saw it on the outside and he just saw some linen clothes. But now he sees it and he understands it. And now he believes. So there was evidence in the linen cloth because here's what you got to understand is that something happened when you look at the linen cloth and you look at this, this handkerchief. And I, I guess Paul said it best. Can I just tell you what Paul said? Paul said, where, oh, death, is your victory? Where, oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of his sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in here that got victory today? Is there anybody here that know I'm not supposed to be here right now? I, I need some real folk. Is there anybody in here know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, that I wouldn't be standing here? I'm supposed to be dead sleeping in my grave a long time ago. There was a whole lot of stuff that should have kept me bound up. There was a whole lot of stuff that should have kept me in shackles. There was a whole lot of stuff. But I serve a God that's a chain breaker. I serve a God that'll break generational cycles. I serve a God that'll break depression. I serve a God that'll kill anxiety. I serve a God that'll restore you. Uh, but he has... He has to get up. He has to get up. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You are still in your, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then everything you're doing is in vain. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all of your clapping don't mean nothing. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all of my preaching is for nothing. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, all of your singing is for nothing. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all of your tears are for nothing. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then we don't understand that we wouldn't be here. I wish that was the end of the story. Because I'm tired. But that's not 
how the story ends. Because see, you got to interrogate the text. You got to ask yourself, why did John believe? What is it about what he saw that made him believe? See, I had a good Sunday school teacher. My Sunday school teacher told me this when I was here in that little, in that little room to the side. But you have to investigate, what did he see? What did he see that made him believe? Because he was on the outside first, and he didn't believe. But now he looks at the linen cloths, and then he sees the handkerchief folded neatly. And it's setting apart from the linen cloths. See, in order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, you have to understand a little bit about Hebrew tradition. See, the folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant. And every Jewish boy, Peter and John, would have known this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted. The table was furnished perfectly. And then the servant would wait over to the side and watch the master while they ate. And the master would then take his napkin and he would bald it up and put it down on the table if he was finished. And if, the, if he saw the napkin and it was balded up on the table, then the servant would know to hurry in and grab the stuff off the table because now it was over. But if the napkin was folded, the servant would just sit there and wait. He would not dare even go in to the room. He wouldn't go into the room because he understood what the folded napkin meant. And every Jewish boy would have known what the folded napkin meant. John would have known what the folded napkin meant. Peter would have known what the folded napkin meant. And so there the folded napkin is there because the folded napkin meant I'm not done. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was your shout. You just missed it. He folded the napkin neatly because he wanted them to know if if it was done, I would have just balled it up and just threw it over there with the rest of it. But because I'm not done, watch this, the folded napkin means I'm coming back. Is there anybody in here knows that we serve a God, that he's coming back? He's not done. He's not finished. There is more work to be done. And watch this. He's still working on me, baby. He's still working on you. He's still working on all of us. And so therefore, he folds the napkin up. So let everybody know. I'm not finished. I'm coming back. And when I'm coming back, I'm coming back for you. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Where I go, there ye may be also. This is what I want you to know, church. It's the evidence of the empty tomb and a master who is coming back. So that's why I shout today. I shout today because the tomb was empty. That's why I can't help but praise God when these children come up here and they start singing because that was an empty tomb. That's why tears was flowing through my eyes because I can't help but to remember that there was an empty tomb. I can't help but to remember that there was an empty tomb. And so I began to think about my sister and my siblings. They go and they visit the gravesite of my mother. And they visit the gravesite of my father. My father is in Veteran Memorial, and we go there and see his grave, and he's still there. As a matter of fact, we went a few rows over, Mama Patrick, and we saw my wife's uncle's grave, and he's still there. Went to my mother's grave. She's in Houston Memorial Garden down there in, in Pearland, and saw my mother's grave, Uncle Charles, and she's still there. As a matter of fact, if I walked over a couple of steps, I saw my granny's grave. She's still there. Walk over a little bit more and I 
saw my uncle's grave. He's still there. I saw my great grandmother's grave not too far down the road and it's still there. But there is a grave that's on the outside of Jerusalem. There is a grave that's on the outside of Jerusalem that people go and they visit the grave and nobody's there. There is a grave that people go to and it's empty and they worship an empty grave because he's not there. Is there anybody in here that understands that every time I come here, God, I'm worshiping that the tomb was empty because if the tomb had not been empty, then I don't know if I could be who I am today. But just because the tomb is empty, I can understand that at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today.